Thank you all for joining us today. Our moderator, Suzanne Murtha, will now get our event started. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the fourth <clears throat> for the fourth event of the summit series. Today's topic is automated vehicles in multimodal transportation and transit. I am Suzanne Murtha and I will be moderating today's event. Thank you all for being here today and um, I'm excited to hear our fantastic lineup of speakers. The webinar will be uh, recorded and will be posted on the PA Automated Vehicle Summit website. Before we begin, you will see that the microphone has been automatically muted to reduce background noise. Please feel free to use the chat function throughout the webinar and also use the Q&A section at any time to ask questions about the presentations and our chat moderator, maybe that's me, will voice your questions during the Q&A at the time of the webinar. As we begin today, a poll will appear on the side of your screen asking about what employment sector you are representing. The poll will help the speakers and the audience know what groups are present today. We'll leave the poll up for about a minute and the results will be shown later. We would now like to thank SAE for sponsoring the entire Summit Series webinar events. The Summit Series um, is a series of virtual events created in the wake of the cancellation of the 2020 PA Automated Vehicle Summit Conference. This event is the fourth in the series of webinars that will lead up to the 2021 Virtual Summit in October. There will be approximately one event per month that will focus on a specific topic related to automated vehicles. We'll have many fantastic topics and speakers lined up and our web at our webinars and hope to see you at future events. The next event will be on July 8th and will cover the topic of economic development, market and industry trends. More information will be provided at the end of this webinar. All right, it looks like we have some answers popping up here. All right, the poll has ended and um, maybe there's a way we could find to rerun it. I don't think we have a whole lot of responses, but maybe we could, um, Kevin, we could figure out a way to rerun that during the event somehow. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go first. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Automated Bus Consortium. My name is Suzanne Martha, and I am the National Lead for Connected and Automated Technologies at AECOM. A couple years ago at AECOM, we realized that putting together a, um, uh, an automated full-size transit bus would be quite challenging for many transit agencies, especially now in the COVID world where transit has been, you know, as some of our clients have described, as, as decimated. So the budgets in, in the transit um, industry are not as not you know not as um not as copious as in some other aspects of transportation so we thought it would be a good idea to try to pool some of the funds of some of our transit um, clients and so we put together the automated bus consortium the idea was that if we pooled funds from the autom from the bus um, from the transit agencies that they would be able to work together and putting together requirements for a full size highly automated transit bus. We went to the transit bus manufacturers and asked them what kind of order they would need to be able to invest in the technology. And they suggested between 75 to 100 um, bus order would be enough for them to be able to start investing in full-size transit automation. Things have shifted a little bit since then. And now most of the bus manufacturers are indeed investing in automation. And um, we uh, and it looks like we will be able to go to RFP on behalf of all of our members. We were going to support them in putting out um, a request for proposal for up to 100 full size, highly automated transit buses. And, and we're hoping to have that out sometime this summer. The idea is that with all of the transit agencies working together, that we would be able to buy more buses and create a bigger market for the technology and then also be able to deploy the technology off for, over a variety of different, um, different geographies and different weather patterns and different types of routes and operational design domains, which we'll talk about later. Original, these are our phase one consortium agencies. Some have come left, some have come back in. We have about 10 now as we move to RFP. Uh, this summer, we will have about 10 agencies participating. We, look, we met with uh, many bus vendors. We met with 
bus manufacturers, transit bus manufacturers, shuttle bus manufacturers. We got input from many, many different deployments and from many different technology providers. We wanted to move beyond the smaller shuttle deployments so that more transit users could access automation. Uh, we wanted to move above the 25 mile an hour speed and our requirements are, are much higher than that for the full size automated transit buses and um, the capacity um, for the smaller shuttles is, is around 12 and the applications are limited. We have a much broader breadth of um, description of requirements for performance for the full size bus. Full size buses, automated full size buses are, are not completely unknown. Um, we haven't seen any bulk buys of those um, other than what we are trying to accomplish, um, but there have been some test pilots around the world. We've done an extraordinary amount of industry outreach. Uh, we held an, an automated bus consortium industry forum in 2019. We had um, 120 people come. We had, um, we had 54 bus technology companies and 23 um, other um, types of, of folks come. We conducted one-on-one -on -one meetings. Our team divided up with our transit agency members. We divided up and had one-on-one -on -one meetings with 21 different vendors who were interested in participating. We have, we've spoken to many of them and there are, are many, many of the um, vendors and many of the bus manufacturers are indeed interested and we do expect to get several responses to our RFP that's coming. Um, and so it, it does look like we will be able to get some. We, uh, we relied heavily on input from the market to develop the requirements um, that we'll have in the RFP. We, um, we tracked all the input. Um, we took input from all the bus manufacturers, from all the shuttle manufacturers, from any automation experts who wanted to provide input into our requirements. And so um, we've been working on it for over a year. Whoops, sorry. Um, as I said, we will be um, deploying in uh, over 10 different locations throughout the country all in different places, different locations, different route types. Um, BRT, shuttle service, um, uh, airport, express services. And we did decide, we looked at all the different types of, elect, of, of power options and we did vote, or the consortium did vote on electric vehicles as a way to proceed. And so I wanted to put in a couple of routes. Um, this is our, our MARTA route. Um, you can see um, one of the tools that we developed at AECOM out of this is, um, is a route ranking tool and we can, a route readiness tool and we're helping the agencies just um, look at routes and see how ready those routes are for automation. Here's another one in Houston. All of our agencies who are members have submitted routes. We're currently video um, recording all those routes to include in our route readiness analysis, but also in the RFP that goes out so that all the vendors can have a chance to see what type of automation will be necessary. Our specification that we have coming out in the RFP is based on the APTA white book. Um, and like for the base specification and then also for the electrification. The um, ADS, aspect of it is something we developed at AECOM, as I mentioned, leveraging a lot of industry input. We're anticipating staged development, so, um, sta um, so that the capability of the bus could be updated over the air to be able to execute more tasks over time, so that the idea is not that the buses could be able to do everything all at once. Um, that, that, is, that is not the anticipation. This is my favorite slide. Keep it for the end. Um, so what we've done here is we have made a matrix of all of our operational design domains. And, and down the left side, you see those listed and we see them also listed by stage. And then we've also matrix, matrix that against um, where the particular operational design domain falls. So you can see that most operational design domains, um, among, uh, most functions, most elements, Operational design domain elements are, um, are replicated in most of the routes. And that's pretty exciting because that means for testing, we can look at those top few as we start to develop tests and requirements for the buses. So um, with that, um, let's see if I can go back here and, um, and, uh, and pass to our, and, um, and, and pass to, to our next participant. 
And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I'll try to answer them over there. And uh, next, I want to pass to Brian and ask Brian to introduce himself and talk us through some of the work that he's doing. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, good afternoon. My name is Brian Brillhart. I'm the Director of Operations at Robotic Research. I'd like to take a few minutes to uh, explain to you who uh, Robotic Research is, some projects that we're working on, some of our core competencies, key technologies, and so on. Um, but I also wanted to thank you for the opportunity today to speak to the panel, or to be on the panel and to speak to the group. Um, so Robotic Research has been around for nearly 20 years, founded in the early 2000s working primarily on government contracts at the time, doing automated vehicles mostly for, uh, for government type use. Um, since that time, we have automated over 50 different platforms. So that's not, uh, not to say 50 total vehicles, but 50 different types of vehicles. Uh, we currently have over 80 different or 80 uh, unmanned trucks and we are deployed on four continents. So at our core, robotic research is a, we're an autonomy provider. Um, you know, we believe that autonomy can solve a variety of problems, whether that's increasing efficiency, increasing accessibility, safety, uh, lowering operating cost, and so on. Um, you know, we, we feel that autonomy can provide a, a variety of solutions for our customers, and our goal is to uh, you know, provide that solution uh, to help our customer the best that we can. So we also believe in a uh, what we consider a, a vehicle agnostic uh, type autonomy solution. So the uh, the same types of technologies and principles that run on our our government projects um, also run on our commercial side. So that allows us to be able to transition from uh, different platforms uh, relatively quickly. Um, you know, the, what what you may refer to as the autonomy stack or the technology stack uh, is very similar between these different types of platforms. Um, so we can rely on lessons learned in the past uh, and grow that technology to um, move to the next vehicle or to, uh, you know, to improve that technology as we move forward. So just a, a brief timeline here of, of the company, again, started in 2002 by Alberta Lacaz and Carl Murphy. Um, Key takeaway on this slide, if you look on the left hand side, everything is, is green or tan, that you know, cart color paint. Uh, as you move over to the right hand side, things get glossier. Uh, there's more commercial products there. And that's not to say that we are no longer doing uh, government work. We are still very involved on the government side, but we've also branched into um, more of the commercial side as well. So we're located in Clarksburg, Maryland, uh, just north of DC. We have our very own proving ground at, at our site. Um, it's very convenient to have a, an on-road and off-road testing facility there. We have over three miles of road network uh, at the SRC signalized intersections. And the company is currently uh, around 115 employees that is growing rapidly. So this number may even be old by the, you know, by the week. Uh, again, we, you know, that vehicle agnostic type software, or, you know, as we're talking today, the, the multi-domain or the multimodal type transportation, um, we believe in having a, a technology that is able to uh, outfit anything from that, that military truck to the low speed shuttle um, and, and everything in between. So we are able to branch that technology or move that technology from, from one platform to another um, with a relatively quick speed. Sorry, one second. Okay. Again, we are, we are deployed on over four continents. Uh, most of this is with the local motors Ollie. It's a low speed electric shuttle. Um, has been running around the world. We're currently deploying in uh, Yellowstone National Park. It's around the National Harbor in DC. Uh, we have a deployment going on in Germany. Um, we've been in Australia, Japan, and so on. So we're learning a lot of different uh, rules and regulations from different states, different countries, different continents, and so on. It's all been very helpful for us uh, in the, the growth of the technology. The auto drive system uh, is what we refer to as our, uh, this is our, our base technology that goes on any of our commercial vehicles. And you can think of this as, as two parts, one being the A kit, uh, the, the autonomy kit. Uh, that's your LIDARs, cameras, radars, uh, and the computing power. So this is, think of that as the, you know, the eyes and ears, the brains of the system. 
Uh, there's also the by wire kit or the B kit. This is kind of the, the hands and feet or the muscle of the system. Um, does everything from controlling steering, braking, um, throttle, and so on. Okay, so with an autonomous vehicle, obviously you you have to work in a variety of conditions, um, whether that be operating without GPS, whether that be uh, you work operating in an area where there's uh, high pedestrian traffic, high vehicle traffic, poor weather, uh, poor road conditions, and so on. And again, we've we've designed this kit, and over the years, uh, with our experience, have been able to operate in all of these different. Um, environments it allows us to to have a very uh you know very strong sense for different odds that are thrown at us to understand what that uh, operational design domain looks like and uh, leverage the experience that we've had in the past and uh talking more about our platooning technology um this works on road off road we'll talk about a few other projects here in the, the next few slides where this is used but this is again another one of our core capabilities. Um, you know, we've been doing this for the military side for quite some time, and we're bringing this over to the commercial side, whether it be for uh, class A trucks or for platooning buses. Another look here at uh, some of the, the capabilities we have um, operating without a driver in the seat. Um, for several years now, we have been able to operate vehicles uh, without a safety driver on board at all small and large vehicles. And in, in this picture, you see a Oshkosh PLS truck. This is one of the trucks we use for the Army side. Um, we're able to run these completely uh, unmanned, so no driver in the in the seat at all. Uh, safety operator would be remote or monitoring from a remote location. Um, and again, this is capabilities that we've, we've been uh, experienced with and, and using for quite some time. So maybe not as relevant to uh, the, the the bus world or the transit world, but we've also developed the capability to back up trailers. Uh, so that same platooning formation driving forward uh, with the trailer, we can drive these vehicles in reverse, uh, understand where the trailer goes. This does have some carryover. Um, you know, you can think of backing a bus in the yard, um, you know, parking a bus and that that kind of nature. We have a very good understanding of the vehicle dynamics and what's going on, so it will allow us to park in. Uh, more complex environments and park buses closer together. We also operate in <coughs> GPS denied environments. Um, and obviously, on the government side, this is this is important, but also on the commercial side. Um, you know, if you're thinking about driving in the downtown area, tall buildings, going under overpasses or areas where you lose GPS, um, you know, the system needs to be robust enough and redundant enough in order to operate without GPS. And we have spent quite a bit of time uh, developing that technology and are considered leaders in that field. And again, operating in uh, a variety of weather conditions, you know, not not everywhere has sunny San Diego weather. Um, you know, we we do have to operate in rain and snow. One of the projects we'll talk about in the next few slides, I uh, will obviously see both of those. Um, so again, it's one of those cases that we have to consider, we have to understand, and uh, we have a, a good deal of experience dealing with that. Operating in a variety of uh, road conditions is another uh, key capability. So the pictures on this slide are from National Harbor in DC. It's a rather congested area. Uh, you can see there's a, a car on the wrong side of the street driving towards the vehicle. And the, the software has been able to operate in this environment for quite some time. It operates uh, quite successfully there. Um, and again, it's just another one of those uh, key capabilities or uh, technologies we have that allows us to uh, to drive in some of these scenarios that, that we'll be talking about today. So on the on the back end of all of that autonomy, all of that smarts that makes the vehicle go, uh, you, you need a system that is able to collect the data to understand what happened. Um, you know, this helps both with uh, with testing, with improving the system, and if there ever were an incident and you have to understand uh, you know, what, what happened in that incident. Uh, we've developed a system that we call Ensight. You can think of this as the black box recorder um, that would be in an aircraft. So basically, any electrical signal on the vehicle, whether that be from the cameras, radars, lidars, um, processing, 
any of the controls of the braking, the throttle and steering and so on. All of that is collected, it's all time stamped. So at the end of the day, uh, somebody can go back and take that data, they can analyze it and replay what happens. So you can see there's a picture in the uh, right hand side of the slide uh, showing camera views of the vehicle, the route the vehicle was planning on going, uh, where pedestrians were moving, all those different things that allow us to, to uh, not only diagnose, but improve the software. So we'll dive into some of our current projects that we're working on now and how they uh, relate to today's discussion. So we are the exclusive autonomy provider for New Flyer Bus. We have uh, developed the first proof of concept bus. Uh, we believe this to be the first automated bus in North America. It's currently located at our facility in, in Clarksburg, Maryland. Um, so this is a Excelsior Charge 40 foot bus that uh, is completely autonomous now, uh, runs in a, a level four type configuration. We are also the autonomy provider for local motors and their Ali shuttle. Uh, again, this is the shuttle we've deployed um, around the globe. So it's on four different continents, uh, operates in a, a variety of complex environments and ODDs, uh, such as GPS denied <coughs> environments, heavy pedestrian areas, uh, you know, congested type areas. The CT fast track project, this is with uh, the Connecticut DOT. So this is a, a a project where we are working with New Flyer to develop uh, and to deliver three automated buses. Um, these three buses will operate in a platooning formation. So on the uh, the CT Fast Track, it's a BRT line. Uh, we'll be utilizing B to V and B to I technology uh, as well as our platooning technology, <clears throat> and we're delivering what we call precision docking. So this is the capability to park the bus closely to the curb. Um, you know, we can get within. We're aiming for three inches uh, repeatedly to the curb. This will help for uh, boarding and, and leaving the bus, uh, decreasing the size of that gap between the loading or the, uh, the curb and the bus. Uh, this will also be the first automated bus running in revenue service in North America. So we plan to start building these buses at the end of this year. Uh, they'll be <clears throat> testing in 2022, and I believe entering revenue service at the end of 2022. The exclusive bus lane between New Jersey and New York is another project we're working on. So this is with uh, motor coaches that run <clears throat> run that line through the Lincoln Tunnel every day. Uh, one of the, the biggest problems we see here is um, keeping a, a closer headway between the, the buses or the, the coaches running through the tunnel. Uh, you can improve throughput drastically. You can also uh, improve the overall traffic flow as you don't have the accordion effect going on, we think we can uh, <clears throat> potentially increase throughput through the tunnel by about 10%. And if you can think about the, the number of people that travel through that tunnel daily, um, that's quite a savings. And finally, uh, you know, not necessarily related to buses, but we were working um, with FP Innovations on a class eight platooning project. So this is uh, trucks running in Canada on uh, logging roads. So moving the uh, cut logs from, from the forest to the mill, um, this type of project, you'd have a driver in one truck and then a, a train of platooning trucks behind them. So again, increasing throughput, increasing efficiency, and uh, you know, just overall performance increases. And that is it for me. Um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing here. And then uh, I believe we have questions at the end, so we'll go ahead and hold those. And we'll pass on to Bernard. I know I have some I have some good questions for you, Brian. <laughs> and I think that we were um, I think that we are also going to try to rerun the poll. Um, we've had about double the amount of folks who who joined since we did the poll in the beginning. And um, and um, I think that that can happen concurrently, at least while uh, at least while Bernard starts. And, uh, and so I'd like to introduce Bernard and ask him to um, introduce himself and um, and uh, show us what he's working on. All right, excellent. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank you, uh, you know, for having me on this panel and um, you know, be able to share a little bit of uh, what we're doing down here in Jacksonville. I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking to you about um, our ultimate urban circulator program. Um, and um, talk to you about how we, the strategy and how we're implementing that, 
Um, I'll then share with you some thoughts on our test and learn, um, which is a big part of our strategy on, on how we get there um, and, and really kind of bridges our vision in terms of what we're doing on the R&D side of things. And then talk to you even about um, some applications um, as it relates to low speed shuttles and AVs, um, particularly during the time of COVID. Um, and then, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully end, end on that note. And so, the, you know, the ultimate urban circulator uh, program is really the U2C's vision. Uh, it's a combination of a couple of things. It really was birthed from what do we do with our existing Skyway? And so it was really a big part of how we leverage an existing infrastructure. And so several years ago, the JTA won, uh, were one of the first uh, to win uh, bill grant funding um, to go do this. Um, because the funding was not fully received in terms of the total amount that we, we, we would like to have, we had to break the program or the project into, into phases. And so that's where you see these four buckets and four phases here on the screen of the Bay Street Innovation Corridor, Autonomous Avenue, the remaining Skyway conversion, and then the neighborhood extensions. But what you see in green is the current existing Skyway, which is a two and a half mile eight station system that connects the, the north and south bank of Jacksonville across the St. Johns River. The first phase of the project is the Bay Street Innovation Corridor, which we have applied the bill grant funding to. That is right now in an active two-step procurement, so I'll be limited in terms of the details of what I can share uh, on that. Um, and it's, it's right now in the midst of what we believe will be a contract award uh, really within the next 90 days or so, 60 to 90 days. Um, so very, very excited uh, about that as it relates to um, these actual, actual particular types of um, shuttles. It, 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 we believe it will be the first public transit revenue generating um, service on, in mixed traffic on a public road in the United States. Um, and so we're really we're excited and geared up to, to, to do that. So that's the Bay Street Innovation Corridor. I'll talk a little about the subsequent phases, but essentially the implementation strategy is, is really simple. We're really focused on the first two buckets because the Bay Street Innovation Corridor is at grade, meaning it's all street level. Um, it, is, it is just going to accomplish this three mile loop and really connect what the, uh, what the Skyway really never, um, the vision that it never completed. It, you know, we're gonna really kind of connect the east and west end of downtown and really provide that connectivity with the sports and, uh, and entertainment district. Now, in the first phases, you will have to transfer modes because we will have this at grade um, uh, service and then you still have the Skyway up above. Um, but Autonomous Avenue is the first phase of the Skyway conversion, essentially represents um, the conversion between our Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center and the next station. Um, we focus on those two because um, both of those serve as templates for the remaining phases. So uh, the Bay Street Innovation Corridor is really a template for us on how we're gonna implement all the neighborhood extensions, which are all gonna be street level at grade um, and go into these various neighborhoods. Autonomous Avenue really becomes a template on how we are going to convert the remaining um, two and a half miles, you know, both directions. So a total of five miles, um, all in total. And so um, for us, listening to some of the other presenters, our, our methodology is also to be um, vehicle agnostic um, in, in that approach, um, in a sense of a really focus on really the back end and the, and the entire integration um, that is needed to make this all work. And so even between the at grade and at elevation, which you see here on the screen, really the only difference really is, you know, the infrastructure miscellaneous requirements and the funding, to be honest with you. In terms of IT cybersecurity, in terms of the vehicle, in terms of policy regulations, um, all the things that we really see that play a big part in the, in the implementation strategy, we have boldly said, we expect that you can ride and get on this particular shuttle at elevation and ride it all the way at grade um, and connect all the way from our JRTC um, all the way to the Jaguar Stadium on the on the east end of, of, of that corridor. If I were to show you a little bit of visualization of what Autonomous Avenue is, again, it is the same implementation strategy, but you see here kind of the, the first phase that we're talking about is that first conversion. Um, we have a unique advantage here in Jacksonville. The Skyway, the APM, Automated People Mover um, Train System, 
was one of three pilot systems built in the United States, Jacksonville, Miami, and Detroit. We were the only system that really was never matured to the original vision of a full 10 mile system. And so essentially the U2C is really returning back the vision that the Skyway was hoping to accomplish 30 years ago. The, the system is in, essentially is pretty much aged out, okay? Um, it was retrofitted throughout the years. It actually started out, and the reason I said that we're, we're really well positioned is because the structure itself, the, the first vehicles used for this was rubber tire vehicles used on an elevated roadway, essentially. So, so it was actually purposely built to be a roadway at elevation. In the late 90s, it was retrofitted with a center a monorail system, and then the vehicles were upgraded from Matra vehicles to Bombardier vehicles. And so you, you did have this kind of upgrade that happened that kind of put in the, the kind of the monorail type of, type of system, but then Bombardier subsequently no longer really um, supports um, that particular vehicle model, um, we're now, it's reaching an uh, age of 30 plus years and we're in various states of obsolescence. So we really had to explore whether or not we wanted to upgrade it and put new APM type vehicles or whether it was time to really now, you know, upgrade the system with emerging technologies and really take it into the, you know, the, the, the next century here. And so various stakeholders got together and really decided not only they want to keep it, they wanted to expand it, but they gave us permission to go ahead and really look at using these emerging technologies to really bring the Skyway into the future. And so the concept is relatively simple. Our plan is to really remove that center guide beam again and recreate that roadway to elevation. I'll share with you that we have matured even this phase of, of the concept a little bit further. Um, and what you see here will probably be a little different in the fact that we will remove the center walls and create on both the, the, the east and west lanes, uh, we will create one super highway and repave that across both of the two individual lanes today um, because they're only separated by a gap of about uh, two feet. Uh, and so again, that really kind of uh, provides and solved a couple of issues that we were having as it relates to ADA and such. But, but even on Autonomous Avenue, we've managed to look at a variety of different things that are super critical um, to, to moving the design forward and look at operations and track design, structure the stations, um, a variety of different things, um, and, and, and to mature that system. This system, again, if you're looking at the picture on the lower right hand, you'll see what we call these the substructures, which is essentially the pillars holding it up, and then the superstructure, which is the structure on top of it, um, almost there's, there, there, there are many different substructures and pillar designs throughout the entire system. So what you're seeing here, what we, what we call the hammerhead configuration, which is it's offset to the load up above, but then you have the, the, the westbound lane right next to it, which has a center design. And then you have different stations and different areas of the system also have different designs um, and different configurations. The good news is, our initial engineering evaluation has proven that one, um, uh, it, it, it cannot, it will, it will sustain the autonomous vehicles and it is very well designed even in terms of the crash walls, in terms of crash worthiness. And so we feel really good about being able to leverage and repurpose this existing infrastructure um, we use with autonomous vehicles. Often I'd get asked, okay, you're gonna retrofit the existing Skyway, you're gonna build this roadway at elevation, you're gonna run autonomous vehicles. How are you gonna connect it to the at-grade roadway piece and really build this entire network that is the vision? And so for us, one of the thoughts um, is through a series of ramps. And when you look at how we would just now ramp down and create these ramps that would actually just really ramp you right onto the at-grade corridor, we believe that we have a really good um, system here that will leverage again the existing infrastructure and then really uh, bring those extensions. And so essentially, you start here with the orange, you start with the existing Skyway, and then you start to really mature it through these extensions. Really, the, the, the original vision that 
was meant to, to have happened. And you start to really connect these various neighborhoods of Springfield, San Marco, the emerging medical complex. There is a huge amount of, um, of, of TOD and, and development happening in downtown. You know, I would venture to say Jacksonville is probably one of the few waterfront cities in America um, that is still underdeveloped and is really going through that development boom right now. And so when you look at the, the you know, the, the district and the waterfront uh, projects that are underway, we at the JTA look at the fact that we need to put in the right infrastructure ahead of that, right? It's kind of like you've got to put in the infrastructure um, so that so that your city and your downtown and the people really mature with it and then and, 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 and come. Um, once, once these buildings and once this, these things come, it's almost too late if you're then looking at how you need to put these massive, you know, infrastructure projects uh, uh, underway. And so we are really kind of, you know, leaning in head on. And the fact that, you know, we've chosen to use autonomous vehicles um, has really kind of been a real, uh, um, a real big deal, not just for the JTA, but, you know, when we, when we get our funding through the USDOT, part of why um, they really put us on the microscope a bit is it's really kind of been um, looked at as to what other cities can do that have existing infrastructure that need to look at how to repurpose it. So I get into a lot of dialogues with a lot of other transit agencies, a lot of other cities throughout the United States that are looking right now at their existing APMs, um, you know, um, air trains and so on and so forth, and looking at how they can leverage this emerging technology. Um, and so we really see a benefit to it. We believe the technology is here, it's ready. There's certainly maybe some dialogue about levels of maturation and where it needs to be, because um, uh, it still has some ways to go, um, but, but it is there. And for us, the Skyway is really a dedicated roadway that will be almost like a queue jump um, and, 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 and has an enormous amount of positive safety features for us, right? It's another dynamic when we get to the, um, the, the at-grade piece and mixed traffic, but, but we will look at the Skyway as really a benefit to this project. Um, I promised to talk a little bit about, uh, about um, our test and learn program um, in terms of, you know, part of that in our strategy in terms of how we got here. Very early on, as we started testing these autonomous vehicles, we realized that, you know, there's a lot of great companies out there that are doing this work, but, but there was very few people providing them an understanding of really what, what they needed to start to really work on building for us for public consumption. As a public transit authority, we operate and move people on, on a lot of different modes, from paratransit to, uh, to, to, to beachside buggies, which is essentially golf carts. Uh, we operate an APM trains. We operate a 40-foot bus. We operate a ferry. And so we know and understand what it, what it takes to move people. And so we really needed to kind of put out some guidance out there in terms of, you know, with the funding that we receive, both state and federal, you know, we, we needed to kind of let the industry know a little bit about, you know, the, 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 you know, the things they need to accomplish as it relates to ADA and Buy America and, and the expectations of what, how these vehicles needed to perform. And so several years ago, we were the first to put out what we call the Golden 20, which has really kind of become now really the foundation um, out there in the industry with the FTA. Um, we've socialized this with NHTSA, but we boldly shared this with all, um, you know, with the entire market as to the 20 critical guidelines that an autonomous vehicle, autonomous shuttle in particular, really needs uh, to be ready for public consumption. Uh, and so we were able to kind of really advance that. The next thing we did is we really pivoted. We had started to kind of do these, these pilots and these demonstrations, really running the vehicle. We had a, you know, like a single block little test track where we were just running it back and forth, doing demonstrations. So it was, the purpose was both socialization with the community and kind of seeing if these vehicles were actually, you know, doing what they say they were going to do. Um, but then we decided that we really needed to pivot on that. And so we, we took it upon ourselves to kind of say, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna leverage what we currently um, have done, but we took the, that golden 20, we leveraged our past experience, and we basically said that now we needed to start to bring these vehicles and really develop a testing program for ourselves. Um, we had gone down to SunTracks. We're not the only ones doing this. Um, I know, for example, the actual OEMs, the actual tech 
um, companies and, and retrofit companies, and you just heard from robotic research, they do extensive testing. But for us, we wanted to really touch it, feel it, smell it, and really be able to work with um, those organizations as partners to best understand how we can help mature this technology. And so we, we really it started with the Golden 20, and then it started out with understanding how we build those relationships with the AV manufacturers. And so you name it across the board, we, we have relationships with them. And then we basically started to um, um, test these shuttles um, with the associated technology. So for us, it's not just the, the shuttles. And so we made a huge pivot. One, we decided to bring a lot of technology expertise in-house. Uh, I say, and I would say that's a big pivot for the JTA, which is a testament to our CEO, uh, Mr. Nat Ford and the JTA board, because to go out and get private sector people, and so myself, and, a, and, a, and several members of my team are, for, are former Amazonians, people that come from automotive, people that come from private sector, that were able to come here and start to establish this program. And from that, we actually built our own test facility. We have both an indoor facility and an outdoor facility. And we basically put all the slew of technologies from traffic cabinets, traffic signals, ped, sig ped sensors, flood sensors. We've built a remote command and control operations center um, we have also a mobile command bus and, and control operation center, all of which that we've deployed. And so we believe that this is a big part in assisting, um, you know, the tech companies with their NHTSA strategy. It is also part of our NHTSA strategy as we implement Bay Street in terms of here are the testing protocols and the test reports that we've been able to do and demonstrate that these vehicles can perform. We've also been, it's also served us as we were gearing up for our own procurement to put together the right requirements as it relates to cybersecurity vehicle requirements and such. And so from all of that, you know, we've incorporated all the feedback from different um, councils, legal community, um, insurance. You know, we've, we've managed to also address things like IT cybersecurity, the concept of operations, which are all your operational domains, some of the, and some of the risk mitigation. We then took a huge pivot last year by then saying to the industry, well, knowing that NHTSA is still behind in terms of really declaring these shuttles, uh, you know, uh, specifically to be roadworthy, uh, we then had a conversation on, you know, would they allow us to take a roadworthy vehicle, put an autonomous kit on it, and run it on public roads? And the answer was yes. And so we then purchased, most of our other vehicles are leased, but we purchased an all-electric paratransit vehicle from Green Power. And then um, through a procurement, um, put an autonomous kit on it from Peron Robotics. And so we were one of the first, if not the first, I believe, with this particular vehicle to take it and put this retrofit on it. Uh, we took possession of this uh, in December of 2020 um, and have been pretty much now putting it through its paces and our test facility, but also taking it out on the road, socializing it, and doing quite a bit of work as it relates uh, to that. And so for us, we're very proud of it because this for us represents, you know, that, that, that pressure and that opportunity that, look, no matter what, we're gonna put something out there on the road. Now, we also believe that there's a place um, for, for everyone here. And I say that because I truly believe that the AV shuttle has a place. We also believe that there's a place for the automated 40-foot bus. Um, we are also doing a project where we're automating a 40-foot bus as well. And so we, are, we have decided to, across the platforms, take it upon ourselves to pilot some of these out and really move it now into a beta testing phase. Because for us, we are mandated to launch revenue service as part of our project. And so we're really testing this out. And so in our test and learn facility, we moved to our own facility in Armsdale. We basically took a, a parking ride facility, cut, you know, took half the parking lot and really built a test track. Um, and then we, we really kind of launched and, 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 and you know, the, the whole concept of what we do in, in, in our division is not just automation, but it's innovation. And so we looked at things like, how do we bring in safety protocols? And so, you know, the CEO challenged us because, you know, one of the things that if you all don't know is Jacksonville is one of the top 10 uh, pedestrian fatality cities in the United States. And so we looked at, in, in our test track, for example, all of our crosswalks are 3D printed crosswalks. What, we've, what we found, even during our operations, we did a project that I will mention here at closing 
um, uh, um, during the pandemic was in operating these shuttles and doing different things, you actually create a better safety uh, uh, profile and environment within the community that you operate in. Um, and so we saw that for, uh, you know, for the example at Mayo Clinic, where we were operating there for four months and they actually saw people start to adhere to the speed limits that were posted and to what the AVs were driving to. But here, you know, uh, what we've seen is the 3D printed crosswalks appear like ballers or big boulders the further you are away and it triggers the normal driver who's, who's, who's never approached that intersection to really tap his brakes and slow down. And what we wanna do is get people to slow down at pedestrian crossings and intersections. So this just a little bit of flavor of some of the things that we do here um, but, but in that test track, we're doing full V2X testing. Um, the entire slew of the CV2X um, um, profile is also being tested um, as part of what we did. I'll skip through these slides a little, a little uh, faster because these are some of the critical testing elements in terms of how we built our test protocol. I think we are also one of the uh, few, if not only also public transit agencies that it's built its own test procedure, its own test protocol and, and are taking these vehicles through that. The JTA has now tested seven different vehicles across four different platforms. Um, and so I won't bore you with this. Some of this um, comes from some of the NHTSA um, direction, some of the stuff that's already out there as it relates to FMVSS. And so we've been able to leverage some of that. A very simple way of how you know, we built some of our testing. It's, we, we, we fully disclose that it's very specific to us here in Jacksonville. And so, for example, in our test protocol, you won't see a test for how the AV shuttles operate, for example, um, in snow. But, but certainly for us, we built an entire slew of tests. For example, uh, we built our own rainmakers and we do heavy rain testing here to see how the vehicle LIDARs kind of react to that because we have 15 minute downpours here in Jacksonville and you can't afford to shut down a transportation system because you have downpours. And so, you know, we've been able to kind of leverage a very systematic approach of taking a test category, use case, critical element, and then building different um, test protocols for that. And so that's what you see here on the right hand side where we pick the vehicle performance of the test category. We get to deciding that we're going to test concrete, wet concrete, and test it both at flat upgrade and downgrade. And then you see the different categories of testing both wet, dry, across concrete and asphalt. Um, to give you a little flavor of the depth of this, you know, uh, we also operate one of the three vehicles that we currently still maintain and test and operate and our fleet of test and learn is also the Ali 2.0. Um, and so uh, in the Ali 2.0, one of the first things um, that we worked on um, with, with my friend who just presented, Brian from Hubotic Research was, you know, starting to understand um, how that, that vehicle and that tech stack and platform can perform an overtake maneuver. And so here you see here in the video, how the vehicle can fully recognize an obstacle, whether that is a person or a delivery truck, scan the road, understand that it is a two lane road and, and is programmed to understand that it has enough margin to execute an overtake maneuver. For us, you know, in the future, we, we're looking at how we put um, specific safety kind of mechanisms in place through our remote command and control, where we might make that decision remotely, meaning the vehicle might stop and, and kind of at the remote command and control center, actually ask a physical human to um, hit the execute button or give authority to execute that overtake maneuver because we will have not only eyes and ears inside the vehicle, outside the vehicle, but on the street throughout the entire route as well. So that's just to give you a flavor on, you know, how, how in depth we're taking some of this stuff. Um, and in closing, you know, I talked to you about how these, this technology can even be leveraged, um, you know, for the good and even during the pandemic. Um, and so for us, you know, public transit really came to a halt and we, we actually really leaned in, you know, the fact that we had these vehicles, the fact that we, you know, not just the JT, but us and our partners, you know, were available. We looked at what we could do to do our part um, throughout, throughout the entire, throughout the entire crisis um, that was happening. And so, um, you know, for four months straight, the JTA Beep and Navia launched four autonomous vehicles of the Mayo Clinic in mixed traffic on their campus, where we leverage these vehicles to move COVID-19 test samples from the test tent to the laboratory um, on the other side of campus. So it was about uh, uh, a little more than about a quarter mile run um, each way. Uh, and so throughout the, you know, the tenure of this, of this project, 
um, we ran the service every day for four months straight and transported over 30,000 COVID-19 test samples. What was unique about this though, was it was the first time on this particular shuttle and this particular platform that it, was, that it was allowed and done in full level four autonomy. And so we basically removed the safety driver, we removed the safety attendant, we were able to implement a remote kill switch and from our command bus and our command center could kill the vehicle at any time if by any chance it decided to go haywire. But those transport in that you saw in that video, there was no safety driver on board. Um, there was no way for anybody to take control. Uh, and so we fully operated that in full level for uh, autonomy for a period of time. And as I mentioned before, um, you know, over that four month period, almost 200 miles um, of transportation accomplished um, and, and over 30,000 COVID-19 test specimens. So this just gives you a little bit of a flavor of, you know, some of the things that the JT has done, really our marquee project, the U2C, but we're engaged in a slew of multiple things as it relates to innovation, uh, particularly within, within this particular division. We, we fly drones. We are actually exploring an eVTOL air taxi um, uh, partnership um, that will not be autonomous, um, but you know, we took possession of our first two all electric uh, buses from Gillick um, um, January of this year. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, we are looking at what it would take to um, fully automate a 40 foot bus as well. So that just um, is just a little flavor of, you know, the JTA, our U2C project and what we're doing in the space of autonomous vehicles. And with That's that, amazing. Suzanne, I'll turn it back to you. Nothing short of amazing. I can't wait for the question session to, to ask some. I'll give you a hint what the first one's gonna be. Any chance we can integrate your testing regimes into ours? Any chance for sharing? <laughs> Because we thought we did a pretty good job integrating, but I think we missed yours. So maybe there's some chance for uh, linking up. Yep, yep, we can okay. definitely chat about that. <laughs> okay, we have some time to think about it. So you have time um, during Charlie's presentation to, to figure out how to get me to a yes on that uh, testing protocol. <laughs> yeah, 15 minutes. The Charlie, pressure, you're up, I'm excited to. And the pressure. In front of 27 people, 82 people, by the way, um, we, we redid the poll. So maybe we can show um, the results of that poll um, again. There we go. How nice. Okay. So it looks like we have mostly consultants and people who didn't answer. Um, okay. Charlie, um, um, take it away. Please introduce yourself and tell us what you're working on and can't wait to get to questions when you're done. Hey, thanks for that. And Bernard, you, there's a reason that it is a, a leading this this industry in that space. Uh, you, you guys are doing some amazing work down there and uh, a lot to strive for. Um, I'm gonna talk about our AV61 pilot, which is a little more basic uh, than the stuff that uh, Bernard, um, Bernard's been working on, but I, I'll go through it. There's a lot that we've learned and I think there's some good takeaways uh, that, that folks can have from this. So um, the 61 AV was, oh, sorry about that. Um, quick overview of what I'm gonna be going over. I'll go over background of the service that we implemented, uh, discuss the goals and the process, and then I'll touch on the results and the lessons learned that we got. Um, so I think we learned a lot from this. 61 AV was a six month demonstration of a first and last mile solution using an automated shuttle vehicle. It was actually the first automated shuttle that operated in revenue service in the state of Colorado. And we ran this service from January to August 2019. So we're a couple years uh, down the road. I know the technology has changed some, uh, but but this was uh, pretty pretty successful. Uh, we thought from what we learned. So if uh, anyone's familiar uh, with RTD, we're the the primary uh, public transportation provider in the Denver region. Um, the the University of Colorado A line, which runs from downtown Union Station to Denver International Airport. Uh, this shuttle operated off of that. Uh, it's the last station before the airport. Um, and if you're familiar or ever flown into Denver International Airport, you land and you get off to come look at the mountains and you're in the middle of a giant field and very confusing, uh, but there's not much out there. It's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we we kind of selected that for a reason and I'll touch on that a little more in a minute. Um, the route length was about a mile in length. Uh, we operated eight hours a day on weekdays only from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, at 15 minute frequency. 
and it, we did operate in a shared lane with uh, traffic, though it was very light. Uh, the screenshot of the road that we operated on, as you can tell, there's there's not much around it, so there was traffic, but very little traffic. Uh, we partnered with Easy Mile on this project and used their Easy Ten vehicle. Um, so this is a driverless electric shuttle. Um, it op can hold up to 12 people, six seats, uh, six standing. Advertised, they say it can operate up to 15 hours, 12 hours with the air conditioning running. Uh, there is a built-in automatic access ramp that can be deployed from the exterior of the vehicle by pressing a button for passengers that are using mobility devices. And this operates using a pre-mapped network of roads, so there's no need for additional infrastructure uh, for the vehicle to operate on the road. Um, it is slow, it is an automated shuttle, so it, it topped out at about 15 miles an hour. Posted speeds at the site uh, were 25. Uh, this was a big partnership project, so uh, we we partnered with uh, the developer in the area who helped us with some infrastructure upgrades to bus stops, as well as Easy Mile, who provided the vehicle for the pilot. Um, Transdev was our partner for the labor, so there was a customer service ambassador, uh, an attendant on board that kind of monitored, interacted with passengers, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we also partnered with the city of Denver, Panasonic, and Pena Station next. So the goals for this project, I, I try to reiterate this to people. I zoomed out on the route here. You can see it, it, it literally is in the middle of nowhere. There's one office and uh, a park and ride there. The goal was not ridership. We, we weren't trying to get a lot of riders on this. We were basically just wanting to test a proof of concept. We wanted to test the AV technology in a transit setting in, in a place that wasn't going to impact our day-to-day -day operations. We, we didn't want to put this in in place of an existing route uh, where it might impact customers if the AV technology failed or, or service wasn't running, that sort of thing. So um, I think we, we got that and, and we were happy that we implemented it in the manner that we did. Um, so for the process, uh, it was very complex uh, getting this done. It hadn't been done in the state of Colorado before. And that there, so there was a lot of steps we had to go through both at, at the regulatory level, at local, state and federal. Um, the vehicle we were using did not meet uh, federal motor vehicle safety standards. So we had to get a waiver from NHTSA for that. Um, additionally, we had to get approval from a group known as the Colorado AV Task Force. And they approve basically any autonomous vehicle in the state that's gonna be operating in public right of way. Uh, that group consists of the Colorado Department of Transportation, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, and the Colorado State Patrol. We also needed approval from city and county of Denver. We were operating in the right of way after all. And so, I uh, wanted to make sure that they were okay with, with how we were implementing this project. Next was co contracts. Uh, the fun part of every project, you know, we had to get an agreement with Easy Mile for the vehicle, as well as with Transdev to provide the labor, as I mentioned, for uh, the attendant that was on board the vehicle. Operational. So this was integrated completely with RTD's system. Uh, it was a bus route. It had a schedule. Uh, that meant, you know, planning the route setting up the operating times. When was it gonna run? How often it was gonna run? Where it was gonna stop? Uh, as well as integrating on the back end so that this route would appear um, on our schedules and the Google trip planner, that sort of thing. Um, so we were able to fully integrate it with, with our route system. Additionally, there were infrastructure improvements needed. Uh, there was only, uh, you know, the, we have a, a rail station there. So that was one of the stops, but there weren't any other bus stops in the area. So we had to add ADA compliant bus stops uh, for the route to serve. And, and finally, we did marketing to the public beforehand before we were able to implement uh, the pilot project. So results, I think we learned a lot uh, from this that we can take forward. Uh, the first is that there, we did experience, um, you know, a decent amount of tech issues, which I know uh, the industry is working on it, to, to improve uh, rain. Uh, the, the vehicle, you know, if, if the ramp picked up too much, uh, the vehicle wouldn't operate correctly. Um, we had a backup cut stored uh, at the at the warehouse site, and so when we'd have these technology issues, uh, the customer service ambassador would would take the um, autonomous vehicle back to the warehouse and pull out the cutaway to run the route, so that we didn't uh, not operate our revenue service as scheduled. Um, snow, it does snow in Denver, unlike Jacksonville. Uh, so we do have those issues. The pretty much, if if it snowed, um, our, our our autonomous shuttle would not run. So on those days, pretty much just running a cutaway. Um, another issue was the battery life, and I think this is one thing that's 
very key for us. Uh, the battery life as advertised did not perform. Um, it, as, this was particularly true in the summer uh, when the air conditioning was running on the vehicle. We were only getting about half, half the day um, of revenue service until uh, the vehicle had to be basically lost battery and had to be returned. And then we pulled out the cutaway vehicle again. Additionally, something that you don't think about as much, uh, and I think this is partially just because it's an electric vehicle, is, is the cold. There was a heater on the vehicle um, to keep the, uh, you know, the passengers and, and the ambassador on board uh, warm, but on very cold days, you know, below 20 degrees, uh, it got too cold in, in the vehicle for, uh, to be comfortable. And so at, at that point, again, we, we pulled out um, the, the cutaway bus for that. So we had very mixed results in terms of the number of revenue hours that were served uh, by the AV uh, as low as 46%. Um, those are on some of those snowy weeks or uh, when it was really hot in the summer and the AC was blasting the entire time. And then, you know, on milder, clearer days that we often have in Denver, uh, we were right, the AV operated pretty flawlessly, um, you know, 99% for many weeks uh, AV availability. So, um, and lessons learned, I think the biggest takeaway is that this process takes a lot of time uh, and understanding. It's very complex. We were kind of uh, one of the first doing this in Colorado. And so there were a lot of learning moments as far as that goes. Uh, additionally, there were a lot of uh, stakeholders in our project. And you know, when you, the more people you involve, the more opinions you get and uh, keeping everyone you know, focused on, on the end goal uh, to move the project forward is key. Uh, proactive marketing uh, with the public it is important. There is a lot of hesitancy around boarding a vehicle where there's not a human driver and it's just, you know, operating autonomously. Uh, and then understanding the budget is complex. We had different things come up throughout the project uh, you, that, that changed the costs and everything and, and figuring out who was going to absorb that and pay, pay those costs. Uh, and finally, staff of the project, I think, Bernard is a testament to this in Jacksonville having a, a project champion to push, push this through and break down those roadblocks that we often run into in the public sector. So th this, it's been a couple of years since this project uh, ran and we've applied for funding, um, different federal grants to um, do kind of a next steps, similar sh shuttle project in a more comp complicated operating environment. Uh, we haven't won any funding, unfortunately. So um, this is all we've got at this point, but there is a lot of interest and AV shuttle demonstration projects throughout the metro. I know different groups are um, pursuing funding and, and getting those projects implemented and we're working with them. Uh, there's also, you know, the research component that we're very interested in and in partnering with universities or research institutes, further study how, how we can deploy this and how the public is going to, um, you know, uh, react to autonomous vehicles and, and riding in one. But we do have a, a lot of challenges at RTD with deploying autonomous vehicles. The, the primary one is funding, right? Uh, we had a voter passed um, tax referendum, sales tax referendum in the mid 2000s for a significant capital rail expansion throughout the region. Um, costs have gone up and revenues have been less than expected. And so we have not yet finished uh, that, that build out, that rail build out. And so politically that's kind of where what the priority is for the agency right now is to finish, finish those uh, corridors that were planned in the mid 2000s. So we don't have um, the, the funding available uh, to, to do this kind of stuff, um, you know, as much as we would like. Additionally, we, we do not have any dedicated staff for AV projects. I think, um, you know, that's so important. And we've, we've gone through a downsizing. We had layoffs in January, so we've lost staff on, on my team. And, and so having, having the staff to um, manage and, and push these projects through is very important. And additionally, uh, ADA compliant vehicles. Um, the vehicle that we used uh, was not officially ADA compliant, though there was a ramp. Um, our, our team decided that there needs to be tie down spaces, right, for uh, a wheelchair or a mobility device to be tied down in the vehicle. Um, I know that there are, uh, I, I'm sure that there are techni technical uh, solutions to this that either are or are not already uh, out there. Um, so that's one of the challenges we've had that I know uh, can be solved. But that's all I've got. Um, happy to answer questions. I think we're going into questions now, right, Suzanne? That's correct, Charlie. Cool. And so 
Um, and so here goes, uh, here begins our question and answer session and um, we are going to stop sharing screens. Um, that's in my directions for everybody. And, um, and if you have any questions, please put them in the, um, the Q and a box there. And we can read them. I haven't, I've only seen 1 question um, during the. During the session, so, um, uh, so if you have any others, now's a good time to ask. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck with my questions. Um, for the, for the next few, uh, next few minutes. So, um, I'll start back to the beginning. Um, Brian. And maybe, maybe I should ask 1st, there are no questions in the question box. Do any of you have questions for each other or for me? I'll ask Bernard, you know, how, how do you uh, kind of coalesce the, the internal support to, um, you know, get the staffing and funding needed to push the kind of, you know, projects that you guys are working on forward? I'd love to hear more about that background. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I'm probably not the one to answer that. I think a, a big part of that has to do with um, um, just being really fortunate with um, having forward thinking leadership, like I mentioned before, I think, you know, Nat Ford, um, you know, being the leader of the JTA, um, us having a pretty progressive and dynamic uh, board of directors um, that has been extremely supportive. Um, and then I think, you know, for the JTA having built a reputation of ability to execute on projects. So all of that has kind of continued to build momentum with, um, you know, winning grants, getting funding from the FTA, getting funding from the US DOT, and, and then, you know, through those relationships. Um, and, then, and then I think, you know, that has attracted, that has been attractive um, for, for people who want to now be at the JTA. Uh, you know, for me, um, when this project happened to have been won by Jacksonville, um, you know, it was just, it was just a great opportunity um, what I was, you know, I, I happened to um, have moved to Jacksonville Hill with Amazon, but then when, when they won this and it was kind of like, you know, doing something so sexy, you know, working with AVs and actually maturing this, this, this project and this program, that's what, that's what happened. But, you know, um, even the other folks that I've been able to bring on board, it's really been a testament to that. So I, th I think some of it is luck, but I think some of it is also, you know, execution. Um, some of the, 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 the things that we've been able to do that have afforded us really the opportunity to get a lot of great grant funding um, and so on and so forth. And then I, I'll, I'll close by saying this, the JT is also blessed by the fact that we are not so revenue dependent. That's probably something that's also a little different than other transit agencies. And we leverage the entire kind of profile of what the JTA can do. Um, we, 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 we operate and maintain our own bus fleet, but we are unique because we're one of the few transit agencies, there's several, I think, um, you know, five or six throughout the, the country, but we also build roads and bridges, the majority of, you know, bridges and roads. Um, and so when we go in to propose a project, we actually look at it with a complete strategic vision from, from, from curb all the way to, to the customer, right? We're looking at what sidewalks we built for you. We're looking at how we build the roadway. We're looking at what the vehicle we put on. We're looking at the service that we're going to put in. Um, and so that's a very unique, um, you know, pedigree to have. And I think all that benefits us to be able to attract um, both talent and get funding. That's brilliant. And then there's a question that builds on that, um, Bernard, um, and um, and. Charlie is that uh, so the question is from Jack Dean at New Jersey Transit and he says interesting RTD variations in availability. How is JTAs and newer generation shuttles more robust? So I think that that's a little bit of a complex answer. So I'll start and then I'll, maybe I'll punt it to Bernard and Charlie to follow up. Um, I think you heard um, Jack Charlie talked about one shuttle type. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> it would probably also be really good to answer this. He talked about a bunch of different, um, uh, Charlie talked about one shuttle type and Bernard talked about outfitting several different types of vehicles. And so um, he's looking at a variety of different types of vehicles in terms of robustness. And I'm not sure what version of the, um, the easy mile vehicle Charlie was using. Um, I'm sure that Brian knows, um, but uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Brian could comment on the robustness. And then also um, remember that Charlie talked about snow 
we found that in some of our testing as well, that snow was a, was a problem too for some, some of our automated vehicles for some of our clients. And um, fortunately, Bernard also doesn't have snow in Jacksonville. So um, maybe, maybe, or maybe you have tested for snow. You said you tested for rain. I'll, Brian's jumping out of his seat. So I'm gonna let Brian go. So as far as the, you know, when you talk robustness in different weather conditions or whatever, a lot of that also comes down to the vehicle itself. You know, a, a local motor's ollie running in a foot of snow is very different than an Oshkosh PLS with 45 inch tires on it. Um, so the, the inherent ability of the vehicle plays a large part in that. Um, you know, I, I don't think that we will see autonomy make a vehicle that's not made for snow uh, become a, you know, a, a rally car that's able to navigate snow covered roads in deep snow at high speed. You know, that, that's obviously there's you have to consider the type of vehicle you're looking at and, and what the the overall limitations are of that. That said, with with an autonomous system on there, if you have a system that is able to um, understand poor weather conditions and understand that maybe your road surface is degrading, maybe it's going to be uh, you know your traction is degrading those kind of things. Um, you know, I think we can change the behavior of how the vehicle drives, maybe make it less aggressive, maybe, you know, give it more lead time to slow down, um, more following distance with other vehicles and so on and, and improve the experience. Um, but, but yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, you have, you still have to consider the type of vehicle that you have. Um, and is it, if, if you're talking a vehicle with minimal ground clearance and summer tires, is, is that going to performance snow? No. And, and there's no, there's no amount of autonomy that's going to make it do that. Um, so that, you know, there's, there's that consideration also. Cool. Um, uh, Bernard and Charlie, did you have anything to add to that? Or, or... Well, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I, you know, I think um, to Brian's point, um, I think you got to separate the robustness of, you know, the text, the tech stack versus the, versus the vehicle, um, you know, uh, and so uh, it's not necessarily the technology can't for, you know, can't perform and, 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 and make the vehicle go. But um, when you look at it, uh, like as he used the example of the Ollie or any of these AV shuttles that have very low clearance, you put it in a feet of snow, it's not the same as if you put an autonomous kit on a Humvee. Um, so if we're talking the, the robustness is to address weather, it's very, it very much has to do with, with, with the vehicle. It's no different than, you know, you just wouldn't drive your Corvette in a foot of snow, but, you know, uh, you, know you, put, you, put your, you put your Jeep in four wheel drive and I think you're pretty good. All right, so the next question is from Bert Larman. Um, Bernard, are the elevated roads going to be for automated vehicles only, or would foot traffic and bikes be taken into consideration as a way to provide a protected area for those to operate as well? So right now, it's planning it's planned to be just be for the automated vehicles to dedicated roadway. Um, one of the things that um, you know we look at uh, leaning in is how we can um, monetize some of the some of the things that we do uh, and so the thought the thought is still remains open to the fact that um, we could open up our dedicated skyway in the future to similar or like automated vehicles um, maybe that's just for commercial application um, so as you can imagine as former amazonians um, we we've 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 tried to have conversations with Amazon in terms of how this could benefit their their package delivery. We've looked at how you know FedEx, UPS can use a dedicated roadway. Um, right now, you have you know I think everybody's seen um, uh, even here in Jacksonville, commercials just started running about I think Neuro doing you know through Domino's doing pizza delivery, right? So um, those would be kind of profile of things that um, use similar technology that could connect to our our same connected signals and infrastructure. Um, uh, that would benefit from doing that. Um, the elevated roadway is not right now in vision of just kind of open it up to being mixed traffic because the more and more you get away from mixed traffic, it really gets you back to that dedicated roadway that allows you to start to operate at a little bit higher speeds and really serves as a queue jump. While, while you're in mixed traffic, you're just, you're confined again to, you know, the, the, the pace of whatever that traffic flow is um, in addition to what the automation can do. That's right. We found separation not necessary, but to be most helpful. Yep. 
All right, um, I see no more questions. So, um, if you don't give any, you're going to be stuck with mine. So here we go. Um, Brian, can you talk uh, a little bit more about platooning? Um, I want to do a little bit more technical um, dive on the platooning topic. So, 1 of our concerns at AECOM is the lack of um, a safety spectrum to be able to execute communications between vehicles. You mentioned DSRC, Bernard mentioned CV2X. Um, so have you, um, how are, are you able to, are you using a direct um, short range communication to of any type to do um, the platooning? Number one, number two, if not, how are you able to execute that? Because, you know, we would love to be able to execute that outside of the safety spectrum at this point, because it's just such, so challenging in terms of, um, you know, well, you know. Sure. So, so we actually have a dedicated radio. Or dedicated link between each vehicle in the platoon. So okay. we use DSRC to communicate with traffic signals, infrastructure, and so on. But that that vehicle to vehicle communication that's used for platooning is its own dedicated link. Um, so with that, there's a, a great deal of information we share between each vehicle. Um, you know, you can think if the if the lead vehicle is is man driven, um, you can have a sensor kit on there or the autonomy kit running. So everything that the robotic kit sees. Through the, the LIDAR radar camera, all of those decisions are packaged and sent back to the other vehicles. Uh, so not only does the, the following vehicle know what the leader, how they're accelerating, how they're braking, steering, and so on, it also knows what it is seeing ahead. And we're using that map in order to have to navigate against with the follower vehicles. And, and one of the benefits of that is most times when you think platoon, you think line of sight, we need some sort of visual indicator on who we're following. Um, you know, the, the platooning idea is always that that lead vehicle is right there. So the, the way we do it and capture that data, I can go drive your route today with, with mm -hmm. the vehicle and send a platoon of vehicles through tomorrow or next week or next month. Um, so long as there hasn't been major changes to your infrastructure, new roads, buildings or whatever put in, uh, that, that platooning feature can work, you know, in a, in a time lapse type function. So it, okay. it doesn't necessarily need the immediate communication. It just needs to know if I if I know what that leader vehicle saw as it went through, the following vehicles can can act to that and drive against that plan. That's the beauty of platooning and being able right. to share um, data between vehicles, and also um, look for. Um, so I, th I think um, if I didn't mention, I'm on the board of directors of AUVSI, and we're we're looking to change the the name of the association from um, unmanned. To uncrewed, so please look okay. forward to uh, please look forward to a, a shift in language. I'm hoping that sure. we can open that up to more. Uh, so uh, you know, go ahead. So to pull on that one one capability that we see you know being beneficial in the future is that if you were to outfit your your first bus in the row, um, you know, so your your agency already has a host of buses, and rather than making that bus autonomous, retrofitting right. whatever. Yeah. Put a, a small rooftop sensor suite, you know, something of, you know, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar sensor suite that bolts on. You know, it's a simple retrofit. Just provide power to it and communication. The the bus driver can take that bus out and drive it wherever. And then if you had a fleet of, you know, the AECOM vehicles or a fleet of the autonomous or automated buses, they could all follow that in a scalable fashion. So when, you know, when Bernard has heavy traffic, there's a game in town. We can send a platoon of buses that the first one is man driven and the rest follow behind. But on Monday, game's over. We don't need that many buses running around. We can break that chain, have less, you know, automated buses following and, and use that as a scalable function. The same with you could take some of those shuttles, the Alley shuttle or, or what have you, and put it in that chain that if one of those shuttles wants to peel off and go over to, you know, parking lot area K to drop people off, it can peel off on that side and hop back in the main route and everybody scales and platoons. You know, through main sections and then use the, the first mile, last mile type service. So we, we see it as a, you know, it, to, to tie on the, the multimodal idea here, there's a variety of vehicles that serve different use cases. You know, as I think as Bernard said, there, there is a use for that low speed shuttle. Um, but we can also chain that together on, you know, you think game day when the stadium's packed and you need to move people from various parts of the city, but also branch them out to different areas. Cooperative automation is just amazing. And then and I guess that's some of the work that you're looking at in the New York project. That is, yes, absolutely. 
Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, Bernard, I'm giving you more time to to figure out how to get to yes on the requirements. I'll ask Charlie some of my questions first. <laughs> um, uh, Charlie, um, so you mentioned that your deployment was in the middle of nowhere, and it kind of sort of is um, out there um, uh, by the airport. But you know that area is really expanding, right? I mean, there's a lot of build going on out there. Um, do you have any feedback or hope of of being able to expand that particular deployment, or are there any other particular areas that you're looking to deploy in the Denver area that you think would be particularly useful? We submitted an application to USDOT. Um, a, I think it was like a year and a half or two years ago now for a deployment near University of Denver Station, and that this was again uh, going to be partnering with Easy Mile, kind of as a first last mile solution uh, to connect the campus to our light rail station there. Um, but other than that, you know, it, it, everything else is pretty high level. Um, so it's it's tough to put any you know finger on any specific project at this point since they are so high level but i think you know underscoring the uh potential that this has our biggest challenge at rgd has been and is labor and, and the availability of labor and not having enough drivers to operate the service that we need and want to operate and so that you know introducing autonomous vehicles into our fleet would be uh, such a, a boon for us and being able to, you know, provide the service that our customers want and need. Yeah, that's a, that would be great. Okay, um, Bernard, in addition to the requirements, could you talk about JTA's, um, you mentioned EV tolls. Um, you know, we're working in that space as well at AECOM in Florida. Specifically, it's a big deal. Um, do you see um, value of EV tolls in doing whole automated trips. So we're looking at how to integrate the automated ground vehicles with the automated air vehicles and how we could have a full uncrewed um, trip for folks trying to operate uh, within Florida specifically because that's where a lot of this is going on. So I think it's fine to contextualize it to that state. Yes, I, you know, absolutely. I, I mean, I'll, I'll just make one um, clarification point, which is, you know, the EV toll is not automated. It, it, is, it is piloted. Um, and so, uh, but for us, again, we're, we're always going to look at transportation holistically. Um, even uh, as we consider AVs, we look at, for example, um, you know, when we have our parking rides, we, we look today as to um, how that AV shuttle will, will bridge that, the gap with that last mile, right? Which, so you'll, you'll be able to, you know, get onto some, some larger routes and networks, ride our BRT system, um, get to a particular parking ride location, and then uh, maybe take an AV your last two or three miles or where it needs to be. Um, you know, it, it is a dynamic that's changing for public transportation. We've seen micro transit uh, take off quite a bit. This, you know, the advent of scooters and bikes. Um, recently, scooters and bikes got launched here in downtown Jacksonville. Um, but, but you're right. For us, we, we look at it as how we would connect all modes uh, and so for us, um, as an example, where we, where we specifically, we were very purposeful in where we located the Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center. So it's, it's the terminus of the current Skyway, which will be converted to the U2C. But across the street, the JTA built the IBT, the integrated um, bus terminal. So you have Greyhound and, and other bus services there. And then on the other side of that, you have what was formerly, you know, the Jacksonville station um, or um, what potentially could be when, if you bring back commuter rail, Amtrak, or other things. So, so you start to basically get your hub where you, you kind of can connect people with these various modes and so, so that they feel it's seamless. You know, the next part of your question would be, how do you integrate that? There, there certainly, there, there, you, you still, there's still some legway, um, uh, some runway to go here in terms of the technology in terms of an app that will allow you to do your entire trip planning across all those modes from, from I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to take the, the, the metro train, I'm going to stop at the regional transportation center, I'm going to get on an AV, I'll go there, and then, you know, later on, I want to take the EV toll uh, and plan a, a, a different trip. The, the EV toll that we've um, partnered, uh, have had conversations with is a company called Lilium. Um, they're planning on building their home base right outside of Lake Nona, 
Um, they've been in conversations with Miami and other people. It's an all electric um, system. And the, and the reason that we're excited about it is because their infrastructure requirement is really to use the top floors of parking garages. It has the same profile as a helicopter. Most top floors of parking garages are being unused. And so when we look at ourselves, again, we're, we look at ourselves as a regional transportation player. We're looking at ourselves in terms of everything we do in terms of transportation. We see that fitting very well in terms of some of the services we would provide. It's still very green. It's not something that's fully baked. Um, this stuff is still kind of still con in concept and being tested. They're still going through EASA and FAA testing. Um, so, so you know, knock on wood. But, but this is still something that we're starting to explore. Us too. We're super excited about it. You may have seen our press release. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're stoked I about that too. Um, I have. So I know you. Can you say what you need to say in one minute? Because I have a. I ha did, did you need to say something? Did you no, have something awesome? No. Okay. Your picture just jumped up in front of me. I thought maybe you grabbed the mic because I have a. I have an email saying that I have to stop in one minute and read some some awesome stuff. So. I'm going to thank everyone for being here because that was most fun and I really look forward to working with all of you going forward and I'm sure everybody else does. Thank you everyone so much for coming over 80 people. That's fantastic. All right, the part I have to read. Um, after we end the webinar, you will be receiving professional development hours certification. Um, PDH is from Chad Martin. All right, and then, oh, yeah, there's the slide. Okay, the next part I have to read is the webinar. The next webinar will be held on July 8th. We'll cover the specific, specific topic of economic development, uh, economic development market industry trends. The event will be moderated by DCED Secretary Dennis Devin. We'll include presenters from Audrey Russo from the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Technology Council, Mark Thomas, from the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance and Vince Valdez from Southwest Pennsylvania Commission. More information and registration links will be sent in the future. And as always, check the aabsummit.org website for updates. We have a great list of speakers and topics ramping up to the summit in October, and we hope to see you again at our upcoming events. Hey, thank you everyone for being here, and thank you for, um, for asking me to moderate. That was really fun. Um, and I look forward to um, working with you all soon. Kevin? We're good. Thank you very much for everyone, all our panelists, speakers, and, and attendees.